Thank you very much, Francesca. It's very good to be here. And uh, I was glad that we had a little bit of Hopkins at the, uh, the beginning uh, for the first talk uh, uh, this session. And then we had Flannery O'Connor on the second one because that will um, serve us well. Because that's really what I would like to do is like to put Hopkins and O'Connor into conversation uh, for this, this talk. Um, I was first introduced uh, to Michael Paul Gallagher as a doctoral candidate uh, out in Berkeley, California. And my interest in the strategies of a Catholic aesthetic, especially in 20th century literature, led me to appreciate his work. Um, for like him, I was convinced that there was a difference or a texture to the cultural productions of artists and writers who were deeply engaged with Catholic thought. I was often told by my brother Jesuits that I should meet him. I should meet him. I need to meet him. Uh, and I would find him worthy companion to, to be uh, in this relationship between faith and culture. Um, Sadly, the only meeting we had was when uh, Elena actually uh, hosted a Flannery O'Connor symposium at John Cabot uh, University in Rome, just months, I believe, before uh, Father Geller's last illness. And so we did have a, um, a, a wonderful uh, conversation uh, that day, but that was the one and only time that I actually got to meet him. Let me see. I often use Gallagher's Ten Commandments of Radical Postmodernity with my undergraduates. It's found in that book, Clashing Symbols, of course. And though this um, Ten Commandments are tongue in cheek, he does articulate how much of our cultural, political, and religious discourse today is built on these ten fundamental rejections a rejection of reason, of history, of progress, of meta narratives, of institutions, of faith of uniformity, et cetera, et cetera. The result of this, much of this negation over the last 30 years, I would argue, has nourished what former Father General Adolfo Nicolás has called a globalization of superficiality, in which data information has replaced our ability, our desire even, to think deeply and even more so to be moved deeply. And this resonates with Pope Francis's cry against the globalization of indifference that numbs our consciences to this day. Yet Gallagher, like uh, Nicolas and Pope Francis, sensed among us a hunger for a creative alternative to the nihilistic and navel-gazing consequences of postmodernity, an alternative that celebrates difference as a source of depth. How we see difference then, whether in passive or superficial strains, or whether we see difference as the key to a creative vision, these are crucial to Christian faith today. So today, I would like to take two Catholic artists, one from the industrial age of 19th century Britain, Gerard Manley Hopkins, and another from the post-war Southern Gothic tradition of the United States, Flannery O'Connor, and offer us a way to understand a theological aesthetic of difference at work in these two writers. Indeed, I want to suggest in the remainder of this paper that Catholic beauty is a pied beauty, and that this pied beauty says something about how we praise God. I want to compare then how a poet and a short story writer offer the play of difference as a very Catholic way uh, into artistic insight. So first the poem that will act as guide to our exploration. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire called chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow and plow, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange. Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how? With swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Right away, one notices Hopkins' generous aesthetic, seeing difference, not sameness, as the site where beauty resides. One can appreciate the poem as a poetic argument for a theological aesthetics of difference, dappled things, an intense acknowledgement of divine presence at the heart of the diversity of matter. Hopkins was well aware how provocative this was, 
taking a philosophical stand that straddles the centuries-old conflict between two historical polarities in the development of Western aesthetic theory. Prior to and up through the Renaissance, the classical or objective pole dominated, grounded as it was in Platonic idealism. Artistic production was understood in terms of mimesis, as an imitative art. This theory of art was expressed in the phrase ars simie nature, art imitates nature. The creation of work of art was a limited and thus imperfect reflection of metaphysical beauty, a transcendent quality that nonetheless could be detected in all things. Bernard B um, Bosenkett suggests that the classical art of the Greek and the Roman world was, quote, not merely in consideration of the object to be presented, but a consideration of the art of imaginative production by which beauty is born again under the new conditions imposed by another medium. So by copying a thing of beauty, the artist produced a beautiful work of art that shared in a new way with some universal quality. Beauty as a metaphysical attribute of being shared with and illuminated the other qualities of being, the true and the good. The objectivity of beauty then, of truth and goodness, could be discovered in the way a work of art conformed to these metaphysical attributes. The 18th century began a shift, as we all know, to think about these ontological claims of beauty. With the Enlightenment's turn to the subject, philosophical aesthetics shifted from emphasizing the objectivity of beauty to its subjective creation and reception as the beautiful. Following Kant's relegation of aesthetics to the sublime, the emphasis moved from a metaphysics of beauty to a transcendental analysis of the subjective process within human experience. The foundational assumption is expressed then in the phrase de gustibus non est disputandum. One must not dispute what is a matter of taste or in the more evocative paraphrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So with the move to subjective analysis, that which we find beautiful is no longer tethered to a metaphysical reality that might ground it in rational or moral truth. That which is beautiful could make no universal claims upon us. The conflict in contemporary aesthetics between the formal quality of beauty and the subjective reception of what is beautiful ultimately ends in a standoff. One is forced kind of to choose sides between the formal primitive discussion that had beauty as purely objective over the irrational modern over, over emphasis of the subjectivity of the beautiful. These two perspectives coexist in contemporary philosophical aesthetics, but only as irreconcilable differences. One is forced to choose between a supposedly flawed, classical discussion of beauty or the more modern stress on the subjectivity of the beautiful. Yet neither pole seems to suffice, and I think this is what Michael Paul Gallagher's work tried to suggest. Theologians like Hans Urs von Balthasar and my mentor Alejandro Garcia Rivera invoke the need to turn to a theological over a philosophical aesthetics as the only solution, as a way to bring together the objective encounter with beauty and the transformation it has upon the subject as the receptor of such beauty. We see this through the movement of Hopkins' poem, where the two poles become rather a two-part experience. Let's see, do I have it? I think I want to go back to the poem if I can, just so you have it, okay. In the first line, Glory be to God for dappled things, and throughout the entire first stanza of the poem, we get acknowledgement of the play of beauty, of the unique and dynamic ways in which beauty is everywhere in the material world. For Hopkins, this revelation is immediate and unavoidable, a simple instantiation. Hopkins privilege, privileges then the pied beauty of life, giving us a catalog of dappled things. Yet by the end of the poem, the poet's descriptions cannot be contained any longer as merely a list of things. The poet is so moved by the power beyond his own subjectivity, by the power of the strangeness and the wonder of what he sees, that he ends the poem simply praising God as the only viable reply. In the final line of the poem, it praise him. The poet responds to such beauty, for beauty is in the tradition the first name for God. 
What Hopkins' aesthetic vision makes room for, in the words of Flannery O'Connor, is mystery. And mystery erupts within the depths of the human imagination, moving the human heart. Hopkins' theological aesthetic allows, then, for the interplay of a beauty past change, radiating out into the particularity, the uniqueness of the natural world. The objective and the subjective realms of experience organically connected. But more to the point, Hopkins' pied beauty is an exploration, an explosion into difference. It's an aesthetics of contrast, not sameness. All things counter, original, spare, strange, reveal themselves. It is the strangest that, that for Hopkins points to the presence of a God a beauty past change. Like God, the strange is hard to categorize. Language fails, and we are forced to break its boundaries. Hopkins breaks every grammatical rule in an effort to get at this reality. Fresh fire coal chestnut falls. Adjective, noun, and adverb mix as he tries to name that which cannot be named even as he strives to do so. He transforms language to startle us, to confront us, to stop us in our tracks, to wake us up. What Hopkins, with Hopkins, we are far from Plato's vision of the changeless world of forms that exists independent of the world of appearances. Whereas Plato would say that true beauty requires the uncomp un uncompromising white light of the intellect. So we have Plato kind of turned to a white light. There's no play of shadows, no play of colors for Plato. Hopkins, looking at Duns Scotus, who was our, our man here on this side, he sees beauty not in spite of the shadows, but because of them. And so with him we have, of course, the rainbow. Using Duns Scotus, Hopkins found a philosopher that validated his own poetic instincts. For Scot Scotus celebrated difference over sameness, what he called the hesitas, or the thisness and not thatness in all things, the property that makes each thing individual and unique. Rather than Plato's metaphor of beauty as a colorless white light, one might describe Scotus's understanding as a beautiful spectrum of a rainbow, beauty differentiated as through a prism, white light arrayed across a colored continuum. The metaphor of the rainbow is a sound analogy of the deep incarnationalism found throughout Scotus's theology and Hopkins' poetry. The divine logos is found within all creation, various in its depth and realization in and through Christ's incarnation. For Scotus, as for Hopkins, then the doctrine of the incarnation changes everything about being, conceptually, materially, spiritually. The world is literally charged then with the grandeur of God. Confirmed by Sco uh, the Scotian philosophy, Hopkins fashions his own neologisms, right? Inscape and instress to describe his, his aesthetic. The Jesuit literary critic Walter Ong in his own study of Hopkins, describes these terms in the following way. The inscape of being is the distinctive controlling energy that makes a being itself and connects it distinctively with all else. Instress is the action that takes place when the inscape of a given feeling fuses itself in a given human consciousness, bringing sameness and difference together. Instress brings the human self, this particularized subjective human being, into the dynamics of the otherwise objective inscape. Subject and object are given a moment of contact. Only then can we see a larger cosmic connection at play within reality. If discerning the inscape of a thing is in part the experience, uh, the instress of Christ's incarnation, then all art has the possibility of being sacramental a unique mediation of the glory of God. Hopkins' poems provide a moment that make present and felt the unprocessed, primeval nature of a thing in a way that discursive argument cannot comprehend. The poetic stress of a poem forces 
an encounter with the givenness of a thing in its self-expressive power. For all the wonder of it, though, Hopkins thought that in his own time, the experience of InScape was not very common. He notes in his journal how difficult the perception of InScape can be for most people. Quote, I thought how sadly beauty of InScape was unknown and buried away from the simple people, uh, and yet how near at hand it was in the... Uh, if they, excuse me, hand it was, if they had eyes to see it. Hopkins lives in this time overshadowed by the tedium and the grime of the industrial age. Did this not go there? Oh, maybe it did, okay. He found the undifferentiated and superficial experience of city life dehumanizing and monotonous. He was interested in the experience of a beauty past change, but always revealed in the particular, fallen, sinful, and suffering world. It is the foundational proposition of a theological aesthetics of difference. We always experience beauty only in the context of, quote, the garden of good and evil, to quote Alexander Garcia Rivera. It's only in and within the backdrop of shadows and sin that we will see this contrast. To hold for an aesthetics of pied beauty, then, suggests that the discerning eye is in search of the beautiful, of a way of seeing that wades through the catalog of material life uh, to discover the good, or better stated, a way of uncovering what is behind or within the fallenness of the world. Not behind, but within. That's a great uh, line from Denise Levertov uh, in her, one of her great poems. To, to find a sacramental world. It is, in the end, a sacramental aesthetic, the objective glory of God in all things revealed in the quotidian, in everyday difference, Okay, there we go. As ordinary as bread and water, as ordinary as a woodlark, as ordinary as a cloud-fleeced sky, plowed earth, tools, but also a piece of music, a poem, or even a short story, such as one by Flannery O'Connor, which we're going to turn to now. For O'Connor, steeped in the same Catholic intellectual tradition as Hopkins, the doctrine of the incarnation is the fundamental reality that allows the beautiful to be revealed in such grotesque ways throughout her fiction, as Elena just mentioned. The incarnation is not merely, oops, sorry. I think that's where I wanna go. Yes, uh, sorry. The incarnation is not merely a momentary event in history, but the ultimate expression of human history, an event that marks the unique nature of human flourishing. In Orthodox Christian theology, then, the birth of Christ, according to the flesh, is what brings the universal form of the divine into the particular and finite realities of all life. In Christ's resurrection, the sacredness of each and every person is transformed and uniquely participates in this renovation of nature. For me, it is the virgin birth, the incarnation, the resurrection, which are the true, this is what Flannery O'Connor says, excuse me. She says, for me, it is the virgin birth, the incarnation, the resurrection, which are the true laws of the flesh and the physical. She observes this in a letter to Betty Hester. Quote, death, decay, destruction are the suspension of these laws. I am always astonished at the emphasis the church puts on the body. The resurrection of Christ seems the high point in the law of nature. Without a doubt, O'Connor's own vision finds congruence and oftentimes amplification of Hopkins' aesthetic of contrast and difference. There is undeniably something strange, spare, and original in O'Connor's short stories as characters maneuver their way through dark and often impenetrable plots that seemingly lead to nowhere. And yet there is something surprisingly counter to the surface nihilism of her stories. For the endings repeated, repeatedly reveal a surplus of meaning that redirects and reorders the reader toward a deeper religious insight about the mystery of human life. Her art is effective because her readers, if not her characters, experience a transformation of consciousness in which the story is imbued with a new perspective, a deeper possibility of meaning. O'Connor explores the way that the shock of divine grace achieves what she calls, quote, the essential displacement of the reader, a moment when the revelatory flash of insight unexpectedly, unexpectedly becomes the interpretive center of her stories. 
The following excerpt from her essay, The Nature and Aim of Fiction, I think is in direct line with Hopkins' work. Quote, she says, the longer you look at an object, the more of the world you see in it. And it's well to remember that the serious fiction writer always writes about the whole world, no matter how limited his particular scene. For him, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima affects life on the Okini River, and there's not anything he can do about it. The particular and the universal, the passing and that which is past change, are held in creative tension in the artist. Furthermore, O'Connor's level of specificity in her narrative gives her an opportunity to hone in on the strangeness and the originality of both nature and the human person. It's an aesthetic impulse that emphasizes the concrete with a faith that the immediate world itself holds a mystery and a meaning that does not have to be imposed by the artist, but is already present if only recognized. It is often the function of her grotesque characters to engage the reader in this present mystery. O'Connor says as much in another essay affirming that, quote, what the writer sees on the surface will be of interest to him only as he can go through into it, and excuse me, can go through it into an experience of mystery itself. So that one's art will always be pushing its own limits outward toward the limits of mystery until it touches the realm which is the concern of prophets and poets. The, particular, the particularity of her vision of the natural world is often placed center stage in her texts. Her violent endings, almost all of which end with some reference to the natural world, break narrative expectations much like Hopkins' enjammed use of language does in his poetry. O'Connor's texts always decry the separation of the physical world from the spiritual, breaking down barriers between the human and the natural. The natural world, the tree line, the sky, the clouds, and especially the sun, are always commented on every single short story that Flannery O'Connor. There is some reference asking the reader to look at the tree line, to look at the sky, the clouds. They become, in some ways, the nature becomes like a chorus in a Greek tragedy bearing witness to a beauty past change, and a beauty certainly past the consciousness of her characters. The natural landscape, then, reveals what her characters cannot see, the particularity of place as a manifestation of the cosmic and the transcendent. Just as Hopkins' poetic landscapes are neither mythological nor romantically ideal, O'Connor's forests and clouds and rivers have a primeval literalism to them, a brute beauty, you might say, that expresses the presence or power of something greater at stake. We see this especially in the use of O'Connor's use of language. She metaphorically paints the natural world as oddly colored, ready and waiting for a moment of grace to be violently revealed to characters that suffer from delusions of grandeur or myopic vision. There is an echo, I want to go through shortly one story called The River, but really end up with the revelation, her her, her masterpiece, short story. There's an echo of worship and liturgical discourse on baptism in Flannery O'Connor's dramatic story, The River. O'Connor suggests that the drowning of a young boy in a river is a spiritual encounter of baptism. And the reader is startled by any staid associations he or she might have about its significance for Christian life. I wonder if I'm supposed to have... Oh yeah, that's good. The story climaxes when the boy returns to a river where his babysitter has previously brought him to be baptized. Through these waters, the Baptist, the Baptist revival minister had assured the boy that he would now count when he didn't count before, and that he could now enter the kingdom of God with this baptism. Now the four-year-old, the character is a four-year-old, his logic is simple and direct, at least in a kind of naive spiritual economy. If, as he feels, his parents do not want him around, then why not go home to God's kingdom under the river? The story offers an insightful illustration of O'Connor's use of Hopkins' aesthetic vision. She describes the babysitter in the story as a speckled skeleton. So anybody reading speckled immediately thinks of Hopkins if you're teaching literature. The words echoing Hopkins' inscape and emphasizing her uniqueness. Her children, on the farm are described as having identical speckled faces, perhaps signifying both their sameness and their particularity. 
But here on their way to the river, we get O'Connor's really paying homage, I think, to Hopkins' work. I kind of put in yellow those words that just stand out as a kind of homage. They walked on the dirt road for a while, and then they crossed a field stippled with purple weeds and entered the shadows of a wood where the ground was covered with thick pine needles. He, meaning Bevel, the little four-year-old, he had never been in woods before, and he walked carefully, looking from side to side as if he were entering a strange country. They moved along a bridle path that twisted downhill through crackling red leaves, and once catching at a branch to keep himself from slipping, he looked into two frozen green gold eyes enclosed in the darkness of a tree hole. At the bottom of the hill, the woods opened suddenly onto a pasture dotted here and there with, a black and, with black and white cows and sloping down tier after tier to a broad orange stream where the reflection of the sun was set like a diamond. This last image of a sun set like a diamond resonates with the charge of God's glory just as the black and white cows echo the brinded cows of pied beauty. We can imagine the sloping tiers of land to be a vision of landscape plotted and pieced, of all God's handiwork incarnated within the particularity of the world. And when the young boy listens to the Baptist preacher, his eyes follow, quote, drowsily the slow circles of two silent birds revolving high in the air. And we are told that there is, quote, a low red and gold grove of sassafras with hills of dark blue trees behind it and an occasional pine jutting over the skyline. With this image of birds conjuring the Holy Spirit, we have the unmistakable influence of Hopkins, I think, on O'Connor. Here, the natural world does not stand so much as a cosmic choral witness um, of the tragedy that was about to happen, but as the site of redemption the beautiful arrayed on the walks of the river of life. And yet, who registers this poetic inscape in this story? It's only the reader, because rarely, if ever, do any of Flannery O'Connor's characters ever get it. They all die before they get it. Except perhaps for this last story that I'm going to go to. Um, but for this story especially, it's the reader that's left with a kind of a haunting sense of I have to go deeper, I have to dive deeper. Why would this little boy, who ostensibly commits suicide, thinking that he is going to, uh, to be part of God's kingdom under the water? O'Connor invites the reader then to have a kind of a discerning vision, to see the difference between perhaps the grayness of daily life and the kind of fantastic world that the preacher has uh, commented upon. Oh, that's, that was supposed to be my fade into the river which is apparently in uh, Georgia. But here's the last one, Revelation. Perhaps only in her story, Revelation, does the character and the reader both get to see the same pied beauty at work. If you don't know the story, it's the main character is a very self-indulgent woman named Ruby Turpin. And she confuses the righteousness of faith with the pride she feels as a white Christian lady and is thus wrapped up in a kind of moral superiority over race, over her own race and economic class. And throughout the beginning of the story, O'Connor builds up Ruby's spiritual deformity in the first part in terms of being in a doctor's office, assessing the worth of various representatives of the South's class structure, all in terms of sameness, sameness. How similar or dissimilar they are to her. Ruby has a habit of, quote, naming the classes of people, which turns the dissimilarity of each human person into a liability. Difference here, for her, is not a celebration of pied beauty, the variety of the beautiful, but a threat to her own understanding of herself. Instead of leading Ruby to praise, difference causes anxiety of the other. As she falls asleep at night thinking about the complexity of human diversity, quote, she says, moiling and roiling around in her head, she dreams that the classes of people were all crammed in together in a boxcar, being ridden off to be put in a gas oven. O'Connor was reading, um, uh, was, uh, was very interested in the films uh, that were coming out after the Holocaust, actually, um, and uh, was going to see them and, and seeing Life magazine of all these kinds of pictures. So this is very much an image for her. O'Connor makes the explicit analogy to what happens when we classify difference. 
the Holocaust. Ruby's vision of reality forces beauty into sameness. It prescribes what is beautiful from the abstractions of race and class. Just as beauty is coerced into the prevailing manners of a privileged class, so too are the notions of goodness and truth, the other attributes of being. Ruby's aesthetic judgment about the people in the room assumes that a good woman is not so hard to find, for she's right there in her own skin. When the college girl, Mary Grace, sitting in the doctor's waiting room has had enough of Ruby's talk about her good disposition, she hits Ruby in the eye with a book she is reading, and she tries to strangle her. Of course, now we have a big change in the story. She tells her to go back to hell where you came from, you old wart hog. Ruby finds this violent revelation hard to understand, but cannot deny the force of truth in it. The aesthetic question is for Ruby and for the reader, how can I be a hog and me both? How can I be saved and from hell too? In the theological language of Hopkins, Ruby is saved precisely because of the particular blemish, the dappled quality of her life. She can be a hog and me both only in Christ, the inscape that presses upon her worldview. Quoting Hopkins, only then can Christ play in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. Ruby will be lovely or beautiful the more she comes to reflect Christ. As Ruby wrestles with this revelation, in the final scene of the story, we return to the natural world as she marches out to her pig parlor, really pissed off at God for giving her this revelation. O'Connor's use of the realistic natural setting reinforces a Hopkins-like moment in the story as if a transformative light shines upon her. From the brightness of the afternoon setting to the deepening blue hue of evening, Ruby rages at God for giving her such a revelation as she angrily hoses down her pigs. So she's got this, you know, this hose and then she finally sprays it on all of her pigs. And she writes, the color of everything, field and crimson sky, burned for a moment with a transparent intensity. Mrs. Turpin stood there, her gaze fixed on the highway, all her muscles rigid. Then like a monumental statue coming to life, she bent her head slowly and gazed as if through the very heart of mystery, down into the pig parlors at the hogs. They had settled all in one corner around the old sow who was grunting softly. A red glow suffused them. They appeared to pant with a secret life. O'Connor literally paints with words the final revelation where the heavens and the earth open up before the reader. She says, quote, there was only a purple streak in the sky cutting through a field of crimson and leading like an extension of the highway into the descending dusk. A visionary light settled in her eyes. She saw the streak as a vast swirling, swinging bridge extending upward from the earth through a field of living fire. We reach an overwhelming moment in which the pied beauty of nature and the pied beauty of Ruby collide into one another, and the only response is praise. The end of the story has O'Connor, excuse me, the story ends with O'Connor's version of Hopkins' poem. These are the last lines. In the woods around her, the invisible cricket choruses had struck up, but what she had heard were the voices of the souls climbing upward into the starry field and shouting, Hallelujah. So readers are drawn to this strangeness, what is counter, original, spare, as part of the glory of her work a kind of radiance of careful observation, of diving deeper. In the words of the poet Richard Wilbur, she, quote, calls us to the things of this world. We might even say she calls us into the dappled things of this world. This is the glory of Hopkins and O'Connor's aesthetic, a recognition of objective beauty played out in difference, the unique inscape in each and every thing. And what about our own subjective grasp, our own instress? Is this not the surplus of meaning that lingers with us in the endings of her texts and in the endings of Hopkins' poems? I think this is the analogous part to Hopkins' final exhortation, praise. Praise God whose beauty is past change. The reader senses exaltation 
but not through the usual path of triumph, but in a counter path, an original path, a path that goes down into the depths, into the depths of our materiality. Difference, uniqueness moves us and leads us to praise. Thank you.